Hazats. We are live. Hi, Brian Mitchell. Hi, Hello, Melissa Rapp. Thank you to everyone who's joining us here in the for our web chat today. We're very excited to speak to you. My name is Melissa Rapp. I am the Associate Dean of Admissions at the Goizueta Business School. And with me today, I have my colleague, Brian Mitchell. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brian Mitchell. As Melissa said, I'm the program dean for our full-time MBA program. That means I lead the one-year and the two-year MBA program here at Emory Goizueta. And it's really great to be with you in this uh, in this format. We're looking forward to chatting with you um, about Emory Goizueta and answering what our questions come our way. Great. Uh, so before we take any questions, Brian and I wanted to take a minute to talk about the programs. We don't have a formal PowerPoint presentation or anything like that. You can find all of this also on our website. So don't be feel like you need to write everything down. But I do want to talk a little bit about what makes Goizueta special and unique and why we think it's one of the best schools to consider for your MBA journey. So to kick that off, let's start with what Brian already mentioned. We do offer a portfolio of MBA programs for you to choose from. So that would be our traditional two-year MBA and then our one-year program. Brian, why don't you talk a little bit about the differences and who might benefit from each of those programs? Absolutely. So. Um I guess normally or usually in the United States, when people historically have thought about MBA program, the two-year MBA model uh, is the most common. It's been around in the States the longest. And that is a traditional four-semester program that starts early in the fall. Um, but you have two semesters uh, of first-year work and then a summer internship in between. And then you come back and complete your your uh, MBA experience with two more academic semesters before going to work full time. And that is a great program for students who are looking to pivot or switch careers. It's a great program for students who want to explore or take time to explore different areas and take time to build depth in their particular area. So that's the most common format for coming back and doing your MBA uh, in the US. However, the one-year MBA program, which is an accelerated uh, program, although it's a smaller program, is a very popular and efficient way of doing an MBA for students who are not making a wholesale career switch. And the real way to think about what differentiates one program from another is to ask yourself the question, how much do I want or really need that summer internship experience? How much does my career transition uh, depend or benefit from the opportunity to do a summer internship? And if you're thinking that that might not be necessary for you to take the next step in your career or get to um, the next type of work that you that you want to do, then a one-year MBA is actually very um, very efficient way to do it. And you're seeing them become more popular in the U.S. We were a first mover in this uh, area. So our one-year program is over 30 years old, very popular with students and a, and a great way to do three semesters um, and finish in 12 calendar months. So you would start in the summer and you would go three semesters in a row and you would finish the following the following May. Um, so each of those programs are full-time MBA programs. Um, for the one-year program, you start in May, as I mentioned, and then you join the returning second years for that for their post internship year so it really does feel like a, a a singular cohort by the time you finish yeah um i know it's a great option for people who already have built within their resume the the credibility to either pivot or to accelerate their career that internship is really important in kind of building that resume credibility if you're trying to make a big pivot so definitely two years for that um, Brian, I know a lot of students, when they look at the one-year and the two-year programs, are thinking, well, what am I giving up in the one-year program? Or are there things like career services that I have to compromise on? Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Absolutely. And remember that the one-year program is much more similar to the two-year program than it is different. You know, these programs are made to um, ensure that a one-year MBA student is not sacrificing um, any aspects of the experience just to gain that, that time back. 
So the programming is very similar. The access to career services starts early and is a frequent part of the journey to make sure that you are exceptionally well prepared for those um, interviews and opportunities uh, as they come. Similarly, uh, international travel experiences are, are the same between the one year and the two year programs. The academic journey is the same, meaning you start with the core experience and then you get into your elective semesters afterwards. So th the real main difference is that is that internship. And to Melissa's point, you want to think about that in terms of what has your previous experience been and how does that experience, in addition to your academic journey, position you for your your next uh, your next move. So these are in the one year program historically uh, students who have a business background um, or who work in an industry and they'd like to stay in that industry but go to another level. Uh, a lot of management consultants who have seen you know, business through a very, very broad lens and want to either work on the client side or at a higher level in consulting. So those are the kinds of paths that would lead you to say, well, a summer internship is is a less valuable to me than getting in and out of the program in, in a year. Yeah. So I, I'd like to continue to talk about academics a little bit. And one of the things that we always talk about is the rigor of our program and how it really equips students to achieve their goals. Um, I know you work closely with our faculty. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about that? Right, so the academic journey is really quite important to us and it should be to anyone who's considering coming back to business school, clearly. I mean, if you think about how diverse we are in terms of our goals and what we wanna do in life and career, you know, there's a lot of differences uh, between us, but one of the things that brings us together, one of the common elements is that we all want a world-class business education. And so you gotta think about this, the set of schools that give you that. And of course, Emory Gorzweta fits you know, squarely in, into that set. And one of the things that makes that true, that makes this academic journey part of a world-class experience is the rigor of our classwork, um, the structure, as I mentioned, the sequencing of our academic pathways. Let me say a little bit more about that because it, it's really critical to the experience, the academic experience that you have and the, and the outcomes that our students have, have seen. And so beginning with your core semester, your first semester, and this is true in the two year and in the one year program, all of your core courses are there in that semester, which feels like a lot. It is very rigorous and a very intensive entree into, into business school, but it's there for a reason. It level sets, right? So everybody comes in with certain blind spots that they wanna fill, but they're not all the same across the class. So everybody gets the same view. Some people come in with very deep experience in one functional area or another, but not across the board. And so the core is meant to level set and help you with some fundamental understanding in terms of uh, tools, skills, and then you are able to take those fundamentals into your elective courses in each subsequent semester. And so you have a lot of opportunities to put them into practice in your electives, a lot of reps so to speak, to get those fundamental tools into practice in the context of the electives, which are guiding your, um, which are guiding your, your career decisions. And so there's a method to the madness. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying that a lot these days because our first year students are in the core right now. And um, there's, like I said, that rigor is really getting to them because it's so, it, it's a lot of work, but there is a method to that. And there are actually starting to see that uh, as they look towards their, their elective semesters. And in your elective semesters, that's when you get to kind of specialize, right? And, and determine what tracks are really interesting to you, what tracks are really applicable to the careers that you want to go into. And one of the things I, I, I really like to remind prospective students of is that although we are intentionally a small program, that does not limit the scope of your choices when it comes to electives or concentrations or, or industries that we are really active in. Of course, we're the number one school in the country for consulting um, jobs. And that's I think that's a, a, a well-known uh, fact about Coisueta, but that's not certainly not the only thing that we do. Um, and so the, the amount of choices or the breadth of choices that you have from an elective standpoint um, becomes, becomes evident really early. 
It gives you a chance to specialize or go deep in a lot of different areas. I've always thought of the core as kind of that solid building blocks that you need to have this broad knowledge of business if you want to be a true business leader. And the, the further you progress in your career, the more you need to know a little bit about everything. You're no longer just dealing with, you know, the operation side of something, or you're no longer just focused on marketing. You have to be able to sit at the table and discuss that broad range of topics, which is really what the core enables you to do. And then the electives is really all about what do you want to specialize in? What do you want to go deep in? And so it's, it's the nice balance of breadth and depth that I think sets our students up for a lot of success. Absolutely. And, and there are areas, I mean, every student I think has, you know, academic concentration areas that they're interested in. And hopefully we'll get some of those, a uh, chance to talk about some of those um, at, at Goizueta through questions and through our own kind of description of the, of the programs. So let's move kind of a little bit away from academics because I know that the MBA experience is much more encompassing than just being in the classroom. And so let's talk a little bit about the community. You talked already about how we are small by design and that's something that we feel very committed to as a school. We're not looking to grow our programs because we feel like the intimate learning environment is an important part of our experience. Talk to us about the community and why that intimate learning environment is something that we stay committed to. Right, that's a very important distinction for us. And as you all are thinking about your journeys um, in terms of what kind of experience do I want to have during the two years or one year that I'm in the program? What do I want that to feel like? I started to tell you a little bit earlier about this set of great schools, you know, the, the rigorous academics, and that's the thing that brings us all together, right? We want that. But if you then layer over um, the fact that we deliver that level of academic experience in an environment that is intentionally small, you know, we're among the smallest of the top 20 MBA programs. And so, you know, you, instead of coming in as one of a thousand, or even 500, or even 300. You're coming into Guizueta as one of around 150 or 160 students. And that really feels different, you know, in terms of getting to know your classmates, feeling ingrained in the community, um, having the type of access and relationships with your faculty and your leadership. All of those little things are not so little when you're going through an MBA program um, and the academics do become stressful. So you need a little bit of one-on-one -on -one time or the career conversations start to become more focused and you really wanna talk to someone with, with inroads in a particular industry. Um, it, or you really want to develop as a leader and you're looking for opportunities to really not hide back, you know, um, but be seen and to, and to lead from the front. And that's the way that coming to a program that is, we call it an, the intimate learning environment. That's a real difference at Goizueta when you start to compare it to other really good schools, because usually really good schools are also really big schools. And you can look at the data and kind of see how that, how that plays out. So that becomes a real unique factor for Goizueta where you get the combination of an excellent business education in an environment that is high touch you know, in an environment that is intimate by design. Uh, and that that really shows itself in, in many different ways. I had my office hours this morning, Melissa, and I was pleased to, I am pleased to be able to tell you that for each student that, that joined me for our virtual chat this morning, I already knew all of them by name and where they were from. And I knew a bit of their personal story and we're still only into September. You know, we still haven't had a lot of time together. And so that's really a hallmark of how we deliver the experience and it makes a big difference uh, at, at, at Google, our community. So one of the concerns I hear students bring up and I, I, I totally get it because now that I've been at Goizueta for over a year, I've really seen the opportunities the students have to be leaders and that, you know, there are as many leadership opportunities as any other program because of the depth of our experience, but you're not competing with as many people to take a leadership position and you know, when you have such a student-centric experience, everybody needs to show up. And so 
all of the leaders among leaders we have in our student population get a chance to be in front and do that leadership and build that, that ability. Um, but I have heard a lot of students say, well, is it gonna be a big enough network? Does, you know, you've been this small school for so long, does that limit me um, when it comes to having alumni to network with and, and how, what's the impact gonna be kind of long-term of having this smaller environment? So I'm proudly a Cozueta alum, so I'm probably the most biased person you can ask this question uh, to. But I will say that I, I did live this as an alum uh, for years before I came back as, a, as the dean of the program. And I will say, when I talk about what the intimate learning environment feels like as a student, what that translates to while you're in the program is a very high level of engagement a very high level of commitment to what you are a part of. The community is not just a, a word that we, that we throw around. It's actually our foundational core value is community. Um, and the things that Melissa was just mentioning about leadership opportunities and ways to, ways to really show up and, and be seen, all of that starts as a student in the program. And so when you finish as an alum and you go out into these great careers and all across the world into these into these um, these great spaces and places, you don't lose that. You don't lose that sense of engagement, that sense of community. And so when the phone rings or when your inbox fills up with messages from students reaching out, you're very quick to return those calls or return those emails you're highly engaged. And I will say this, I say this all the time, and there's nobody any good to have a giant massive network of people who just won't call you back or people who won't pick up the phone. And that is absolutely a benefit of being part of this community is our alumni are exceptionally highly engaged. And so you have a responsive network and an effective network. And I'm proud to be a part of that and have been a part of it uh, since my time at Quizway. We even, when we're working with prospective students, encourage them to use LinkedIn as a means of kind of testing this theory out. And so if there is an, an, an area that you're interested in, an industry, um, use that advanced search feature in LinkedIn and find a Goizueta alum, find a few of them and reach out and see the responses you get. Um, we're confident that you'll get great feedback about the programs. Um, and about, you know, you'll just have a good experience that way. Um, so I want to kind of move us along so we have plenty of time for questions and talk about where Goizueta is located in the world and what benefits there are in being in Atlanta and being so close to such a vibrant metropolitan area. Right, so I'm, my understanding is that we have folks joining us today from all around the world. Uh, some of whom probably are very familiar with where we are and some of whom probably have never, you know, been to or considered uh, coming uh, to Atlanta before. So um, I can tell you that uh, it is a place where as a business school student, our community has found it to be a, an ideal place to come to business school and an ideal place a lot of times to get great business experience and exposure. Atlanta is ranked number three in the country for Fortune 500 headquarters, right? So out of out of the Fortune 1000 companies, over 750 of them have a presence here in Atlanta. So it is a very well connected city for business. And if you think about what we um, what we try to um, describe as far as the intimate learning environment, right? If you combine that with the type of access that you have for business, you know, or for learning about an industry and going for quick chats and getting exposure, that is a that is a, a priceless combination because usually that's a trade off that you have to make. Right. So you could either have, you know, an intimate, you know, small school experience, but be nowhere near a major city where you could where you can have great access or you can be in the big city and not have an intimate experience at Goizueta, that's really the crucial uh intersection of our value proposition that you know helps people 
um, helps people see, wow, this is a special place. And so if you're interested in marketing, you know, you're just right down the street from some great brands, uh, you know, including Coca-Cola, who were you know, probably required to mention at least once during the, during this call, right? Um, to to get you know some exposure to that. If you're interested in consulting, every single firm has a major office here. If you're interested in finance, you know, big banks, you know, things of that sort. So um, you get all of that in a place in in a city like this. But not only is it about the business connections, which you know you can't you can't stress that enough in business school. But it's also about a place that's culturally diverse, a place that is a great place to actually live, you know, for a couple of years and experience um, as a as a global citizen. This is a fantastic city for uh, for cultural you know experiences. It's a great place to eat, you know. Like uh, Melissa and I often talk about, uh, you know, what a great restaurant scene Atlanta has and and a great you know social scene. So um, it's a big city for sure. Um, I think sometimes people who haven't been here don't realize what a, what a big and busy city this is. The world's busiest airport uh, is here in Atlanta, so it can get you anywhere in the world on a direct flight, which as a former consultant is invaluable uh, when it comes to getting to big cities and small towns. So um, it's a really great, great place to be where you don't have to trade off an intimate experience for having a, a really dynamic city um, at your at your fingertips. So one of the questions that we get in admissions a lot is, I hear you, Atlanta seems great, but I don't want to live in Atlanta when I'm done. Is there a pathway for people to get to the East and West Coast? And what are your connections there? And I, I, you know, I'm very comfortable saying that that's not a problem. I mean, we, we love it here in Atlanta and a lot of our students get here spend their one or two years here and also decide that they love it here. The climate's great. The access is great. You can, you know, drive to the shore, you can drive to the mountains. It's all very accessible. But that's not to say that all of our students do that. Um, we have students who are going back into New York, back to the West Coast. So don't let that be a fear. Our career management center is wonderful at helping people achieve their career goals in all the dimensions that careers have. So that's industry, function, and location. So if you really want to be on the on a coast, we can help you do that as well. Anything to add on that point? I'll just say that, you know, think about where business is done. And, you know, a great program like ours is well placed in all of those places. So yes, students come down to Atlanta to have a fantastic experience in all the ways that I described, but if you want to either get back to a place, so a lot of people come from other places and want to get back, or if the industry that you're interested in is you know, concentrated in another area like you know, tech in the, in the Northwest, you know, where, where biz, wherever business is done, we have a presence there. So the number one hiring companies or the top hiring companies in kind of NBA land are absolutely close partners with us. So company, think about companies that are no geographically nowhere near Atlanta, like Facebook and Google and Apple. You know, we send students to all of those places. Big investment banks in New York, we absolutely send students to all of those banks. Uh, pharmaceutical or brand companies in Chicago and in the Midwest absolutely have a strong network um, and send students to all of those places. So by no means are you tied to Atlanta or the Southeast when you come to, to school here. And I think that's a great question, um, but a very important um, distinction that, um, that that's important to make. And to, to tactically, Melissa, your point about using LinkedIn to connect with our some of our alumni or students, you can do that kind of cross section and see where people are uh, or where people are from and ask questions with that in mind. And you'll see that there are people um, who are well placed all over. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of people are curious about how academics and the program experience have changed in the current climate. And, you know, Atlanta has been in the news a lot lately about COVID, about racial issues, about all sorts of things. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the impact or some of the changes we've made to address anti-racism and diversity and inclusion, and then also what the class situation has been like 
during this time when we're, we have so many restrictions? Right. So I, I say often the summer of 2020, you know, will be defined a, a number of ways. Uh, and it's really important because, you know, COVID-19 tends to dominate our narrative about the summer of 2020. But it's really important to realize that there are intersecting crises that that really came to bear uh, during the summer. Uh, and my summer in particular, and I think this is true for a lot of people on this call, was spent actively, actively dealing with the COVID-19 crisis and the crisis of anti-racism or racist violence here in uh, in the States. And some of that, you know, closer to home than uh, than others. And so um, we've been we've taken a very active stance. I don't think it's only because I am the program dean and happen to look the way that I do. I think that's part of our values as a university and as a business school. But I'm proud to be um, a leader in that conversation at Coisweta. And some of the actionable things that we've done on the anti-racism front have had to do with expanding our conversation about the role of race and racism in business beyond those folks who would typically opt into the conversation and open it up to everyone um, uh, who touches our programs. So we have a common read that we um, that we would always do for um, students who opted in uh, called Whistling Vivaldi. It's a great book about bias and stereotype threat and everyone should should read it. So plug for for Claude Steele uh, and his and his great book called again Whistling Vivaldi. But this year we get no compensation for this. We don't. For this plug. No, I'm going to write no. my own book just a great doing book. it that way, but it is a great book. And I encourage you all to read it because it's, it's in particular a great book as you enter into a new academic environment. So it talks about the burden of, of stereotype threat of bias and of racism on people as they enter into and, and go through an academic environment, but it touches on societal challenges and it's very topical for what we're going through right now. So we expanded that conversation to the entire community and we're able to have a full community discussion this year, which is different from what we have had in, in um, historical years where it's, a, it's, again, it's an opt-in, so sort of preach to the choir conversation. It was much more inclusive and much uh, broader just like what we saw this summer with the protests and the participation in this movement was much broader than what we have historically seen. So we've been tracking along with that at Coisweta. Um, we, this week, um, had on Wednesday, Ibram Kendi, who is the author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, he delivered a web chat um, to the Emory community and we were actively a part of that. So kind of from the horse's mouth being in that conversation, I think has been really important to us. On the COVID-19 side, you know, Emory University is very well known for healthcare. I am a shameless alumni of our School of Public Health. And so I pay very close attention to this through that lens. I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm a policy guy, but I do have a special interest from the public health side. So as this crisis has been um, really growing since the spring and especially over the summer, We've been really thinking about how we would deal with it on our campus this fall and beyond. So our decision was for our MBA programs to come back to school, come back to campus in a hybrid way. So overall, we've we've taken on the, the first tactic of de-densifying the, the overall campus population, but still having a hybrid model available for our MBA students to have some campus experience. And then we've integrated the same public health uh, procedures that we should all be following every day in our in our lives off campus, which are keeping your physical distance. So the building has been, you know, redesigned for us to sit together, but still be at least six feet apart. Uh, so keeping our physical distance, wearing our masks at all times, um, washing our hands obsessively, I would say um, really paying close attention to our symptoms is a big part of it. So we've been um, really, I think, on the forefront of being able to have an on-campus experience for our students uh, this semester. Um, we talked a little bit about Atlanta and you know the Fortune 500 companies and how well connected it is, but I, I don't want to miss the opportunity to also talk about 
what a dynamic startup community is. I know many MBAs are super interested in um, entrepreneurship, either immediately following business school or maybe down the road. Um, innovation and technology is an important part of an experience that many of our MBA prospects are looking for. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the developments that we've been having here in Atlanta and the connections Emory has that students can leverage? Yeah, if you know me, Melissa, it's one of my favorite things to talk about because we've really doubled down in a, a few of our strategic areas um, recently at the business school, which is very exciting. And entrepreneurship and innovation has always been, you know, a big part of what we do. But when I say doubling down, I mean doubling down in terms of investment and focus in an area. So it's a really big deal when schools create institutes. So we are in the process of creating our Institute for Innovation uh, and Entrepreneurship, which is um, highly engaged in the Atlanta startup and tech community, but also has a global reach uh, where I've been you know, directly involved. And I think that's super exciting. I saw a question um, about Atlanta Tech Village. Uh, so someone knows something about uh, Atlanta. Uh, in our audience here. Um, Atlanta Tech Village is a hub for entrepreneurs and in particular in the tech space uh, here in Atlanta. And they're well resourced with um, other startup minds, uh, financing you know, opportunities, pitch opportunities, everything that you would expect in an inc inc incubation hub um, in a major city like ours. You can also find attorneys who can help with intellectual property and all of those things at Atlanta Tech Village. I think it's a very important point for those who are interested in this area to know that the number one uh, leaseholder from a square footage standpoint, the number one academic institution uh, there at Atlanta Tech Village is Emory Coizueta. And so if you want to go over to meet with other entrepreneurs and incubate your ideas, we have space there that's dedicated for our students. And it's, you know, we are the leaders in that area. And ATV, Atlanta Tech Village, is um, right, you know, a couple of miles off campus. It's a great hub but right on campus. Another signal for our doubling down is the creation of what we call the hatchery. Uh, the hatchery is the on campus innovation hub that's launching right now. And so students who what I always say is, you know, dipping your toe in the water or just have a new idea and you want to get a broad range of thinking around your idea from your colleagues in the business school, but also, you know, imagine that you're coming up with a medical innovation and you want to pressure test it with with students or faculty from the medical school and the public health school. You know, those kinds of things are possible at a university level incubation hub. So the hatchery is ours and we're really excited about it. It's a beautiful space. It's right on campus. So that's something that we can we can really have you take advantage of as well. All right. Thanks, Brian. Um, I think we can go ahead and start taking more of the questions that are in the chat um, and see what we have. Do you want to, can you elaborate on engagement? Well, I think we just covered that one. So let's move on. We covered that one pretty well in the last discussion. Let's see what else we've got. I actually think that question was from someone who I, who I may have met in a uh, in previous encounter. So if Malcolm Talbert, is who I think he is, then uh, we may have some history in common. I'm on mute. I'm a physician interested in furthering my career in an administrative company. How many of your MBA graduates go into healthcare? This one is like made for Dean Mitchell. Um, you may have mentioned here him mention he has a dual degree. Um, he has not talked yet, but we'll be happy to talk about his own career in the healthcare space, and then also what other students have done as well. Yeah, that's like a that's like a hanging curveball um, to just hit right out of the park uh, for me because it's a it's one of my favorite things to talk about. So, Melissa, you're definitely going to have to stop me from going too long on this one. You know, I, I had a 20 year career in the healthcare space, and in particular in pharma. And so I'm very, very familiar with the intersection between business and healthcare and how Emory and, and Guizueta can really help with that. From a physician's standpoint, we have a, a great story uh, to tell around the number of physicians 
from the Emory community and from abroad, right, out in the U.S. and, and around the world who have come to through our programs for exactly what I think you're asking, right, is how do you, uh, how do you take your, your clinical and your, your experience as a physician and put that into practice in the business world? Or how do you bring business skills into your practice as a physician? And coming back to our conversation about the one-year or the two-year program, two-year MBA programs, we have a, a high number of physicians and or medical students who come through the one-year MBA program. So that tends to be a very attractive track. First of all, because it's one year versus two, so the time element um, fits into either an existing course of study or it's a return on investment question in, more in terms of time and opportunity cost. So a number of physicians come through the one-year MBA program and also because you're not really looking for a summer internship usually. Um, you're looking to go directly back into practice or back in the business world. We're able to combine your coursework in your elective semesters between the business school and the School of Public Health or the med school or the law school or other areas, right? And that's really important. You know, if you're, since you're a physician, you, you know, you may not want to go back to taking med school courses, but you may want to take courses at the public health school that, that helps you kind of look at business or your business through that lens. Or you may want to look at it from a law school perspective. So we so we very are we're very much helpful um, in that regard. Healthcare is in our DNA, as I mentioned before, at Emory. And so we have, you know, in all of our programs, you know, and I'll even plug our other MBA programs, our executive MBA uh, programs in either format, um, a number of physicians who come who come back to that. I think the, the way that medicine has gone, and this is not a recent phenomenon, certainly over the past, you know, 20, 25 years, is that a lot of physicians are looking at ways to integrate business into, into what they're doing, um, either in, in a individual way, you know, working in corporate or into their own practice. So this is something where we've grown a great deal. And healthcare is one of our strategic areas of, of investment as well. So we, I can talk about this for a, a really long time. So I'll, I'll that's it. probably enough for today. All right, fair enough. You can, you can find Brian's email address or like hit him up on LinkedIn. He's happy to continue this conversation. It looks like Malcolm confirmed. Are we all still here? Okay. So let's talk about uh, a military veteran transitioning to the civilian world. So Grace Wada also has quite a bit of experience in helping our military veterans transition and um, making their way into new pathways. Um, one of our very most favorite faculty members is retired General Ken Keene, who leads up a part of our leadership development series. Um, why don't, uh, Brian, why don't you talk a little bit about how military veterans go through the program and then a little bit about what Ken Keene's doing for all of our students in terms of leadership development? So, oh. Uh, General Keene is a is an absolute legend and it's well earned before and since his joining uh, Chris Weta, He's actually a Ranger Hall of Famer. He's a retired three star general. And, you know, we could go on uh, gushing over what he's brought brought to us. Um, but one of the aspects of it is the depth in our leadership programming, which starts from bef even before day one and goes through the core your core semester, exposing you um, to uh, concepts, theory, uh, and a little bit of practice uh, from a leadership standpoint. And after that, you know, everybody's leadership journey is a bit different. But in particular, our veteran communities choose, choose to go really pretty deep down this path. Uh, one, General Keene is, of course, a, a great mentor and leader. But number two, our veterans tend to uh, lead the way on having experience with the value and the importance of great leadership right and so you've typically been in a situation where you've been a leader you certainly have been in a situation where you've had leaders hopefully who were great examples of some of the things that we that we teach and that you experience and, and possibly some who you might do things a bit differently and our leadership journey is is you know you can think of it with three components which include the academic component which are the courses that you take and the theory that you learn, the experiential component, which puts those you know, academic theories into practice and pressure tests those, and then the reflective journey. So how, how are you actually stepping back and reflecting on 
what you've learned and what you've experienced. Veterans, uh, in particular Army veterans, will be very familiar with the concept of act after action reviews or AARs. That is very much part of our language now and how we um, how we embrace um, reinforcing the, the leadership journey that everyone is on. And so I think our culture fits very well with that of our veteran students. Um, we, we work really hard. I know, Melissa, your team works really hard on recruiting and yielding um, veterans who fit well with our culture. And my team works really hard on bringing that to life during the time that they are um, in the program. So our veteran community is very well engaged, very active, um, very present in, in our leadership roles. And, and it turns out to be um, a great segue back into transitioning into the civilian world. So I saw, oh, does a green, is a green card holder considered an international student as well? So if you are a permanent resident of the U.S., then we consider you a domestic candidate and all others are considered international candidates. Um, we, all right. Uh, can your second letter of recommendation, I know this acronym, can be from a client if I come from a consulting background, the first one would certainly be from a direct supervisor. So that's perfectly fine. Um, we do design the application to have two letters of recommendation so that you can use an alternate source. Um, our preference is always for one of them to be from a direct supervisor, either current or past. And then the second one is really up to you to find another person who can talk to your abilities in the workplace, to work on teams, the impact you've created, those kinds of things. And that can be a client can be um, a former supervisor, can be a colleague if the situation is right. Um, the only things that we say are faculty recommendations really aren't very helpful in this context and family recommendations are pretty frowned upon. So don't, even if you work in a family business, um, hopefully there's some outside of the family type people that you can tap for a letter of recommendation. Is Emory expecting a surge in applications because of the economic downturn? If current admits are given a chance to defer their enrollment till 21, will the class size increase? So as we mentioned earlier, we will stay committed to the small by design feature of the Goizueta experience. And we did have a large number of deferrals last year, um, larger than typical, but not crazy. Um, and we are actively managing um, just because someone was admitted last year and they chose to defer does not mean that they are guaranteed that they'll want to enroll in the next year. The circumstances change regularly for our deferrals. They may get a promotion and want to delay. They may have a personal situation and want to delay. So we are still in the process of working through which of our deferrals will be enrolling. Um, and our early indicators are that we, we have had more students this year start applications from when the application went live to this date, we have more application starts. That's an early indicator that we may end up with additional applications submitted. Um, it's a little too early to tell. Historically, yes, when the economy takes kind of a downward or there is a high level of job insecurity, applications to MBA programs go up. And so if you just look at the historic data, there is a likelihood that applications will go up. We won't grow our class size past for the two-year program about that 160. Brian, you're gonna make this, you're gonna, we're gonna make this call together at some point, but around 160 is really where we feel like we can deliver the type of experience that we want to deliver. And so we won't grow much beyond that. Uh, and in the one-year program, you know, we've always stayed right around that. Where would we like to be? 67? 55. Yeah, 60. Yeah, 55. Yep. I'll try and, I'm trying to slide in a few more in that one year program. So, uh, so to answer your question, okay. it's hard to tell right now if we will have a, a surge in applications. Uh, we do anticipate a larger volume coming in, uh, but we will be staying committed to the small by design intimate learning experience that we have. Is the one-year program STEM certified? And how likely is this going to be live classroom-based than virtual given the pandemic situation? So Brian, 
I think you can address the STEM question from both one year and two year, um, and then a little bit about kind of the thought process the university uses in well, whether or not we will be in person or continue hybrid learning. Right, thanks. So we think about our programs, the one and two year together. So uh, the STEM question is an active one that we are working through right now. We had the university meeting uh, last week on STEM and one uh, scheduled for November. So stay tuned because that's the big one. And we are optimistic that our programs will be STEM certified in the very near future. So they're on track and they're in front of the university right now with that very question. So we recognize how significant that is and we were, we're working on it um, diligently. And I'm, I'm optimistic about that. So stay tuned um, post November. The question about how likely it will be that we are in person is 100% depending dependent on the pandemic. You know, we don't we don't claim to have any control over what's going on um, with the virus, and so we want to be very deferential to what's happening uh, with the pandemic, with uh, vaccines, with therapeutics, just where we are, and let the public health context dictate how we operate. I say that given where we were this summer was really a scary place. And we are still able to operate in a hybrid format here in the fall. So that should give you, it certainly gives me some confidence that regardless of where the pandemic journey is, we're, we're likely to do, we will do everything that we can to be able to deliver you know, an experience that gives you um, at least some touch points on campus. But I will say this in addition, when we were all, and this is not just Emory, but when we were all asked to kind of leave campuses in the spring and figure out what was going on with COVID-19 at that time, every conversation we had at Emory was about how do we maintain our academic excellence? How do we maintain the quality of the academic journey that continues to prepare you for the journey that you are on? And that has content, continued into the fall. And so everything that we're doing in this hybrid format, or even the courses that are fully online, they are um, intended to deliver on that academic promise. And so we measure that every week through our student surveys and through other touch points to make sure that we're delivering that academic promise that we have always been committed to and we remain committed to that. And so I don't know how we'll look in this coming fall but given where we have just, um, excuse me, come from, we're likely to have some sort of experience on campus, even if it is hybrid, or hopefully by the fall, we're back you know, fully alive again. But one thing you don't have to worry about is whether or not your, your academic journey will be sacrificed. That's not how, that's not how we, we're doing it. And we're showing good results with, with that right now. We might be able to, I've been on mute, sorry, folks. Um, I was just saying, I don't have the expertise to answer this question. Brian, do you have any insights or perhaps we can just connect with this person? I, I don't, I don't know how that works exactly. Uh, so I think a, a, a one-off conversation might be best. All right, I'm a candidate with 11 years of experience and. Will it be a big negative, all caps, big negative in the application process to Emory's one-year program? I would not call that a big negative. Um, really what we're gonna be looking for is where have you created impact in your current role? Um, why are you attracted to Koizueta? And then what are you hoping to do afterwards? And I think you, you need to really be thoughtful about where you are in your career and where you'd like to go. And is the MBA the right piece to help you make that transition. And, and that may or may not be the case. I will put a little plug in here for my admissions team who offers one-on-one -on -one consultation on our website and schedule a 30-minute one-on-one consultation with an admissions director who is 
going to be able to very personally answer questions like these. So they can help you look at your resume, talk about your goals. Is an MBA the right way to do it? Again, we call it a career management center because it's not a job placement center. So just coming here does not mean that that team is going to you know, pick a jar out of a hat and give it to you. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into that and a lot of it is dependent on your background and what you take advantage of during your MBA program. Um, and so that's really where this will come into play. Your goal what will versus how many years of experience you have. We're not going to use that um, and immediately take your application out of consideration. This looks like a question for you, Dean Mitchell. I see it. I see it. Understanding the pedagogy of Cosweta um, when compared to other business schools. So um, if you're doing your homework on, on business school programs, you probably have heard of the case method and are wondering you know, what that is and how much that's used in business schools. Um, some schools exclusively use the case method where there are cases um, that give you business scenarios in a format that can be anywhere between you know, seven and 50 pages and your, you know, your lesson comes from sort of reliving that case. Um, we absolutely use the case method about 60% of the time in the core but it's really important that we blend uh, the approaches. So we have the case method and we also have, you know, lectures and experiential learning and um, other kinds of team based experiences that make up the totality of the experience. I believe I'm a big believer in the blended method because there's just so many different ways to contextualize business problems and ways to contextualize some of the uh, the fundamental tools that we talked about as part of the core experience, you know, and cases are good for that sometimes, but not good for that at other times. So we use the blended method intentionally with still, again, slightly more cases in the core uh, than not. Uh, and then as you get into your elective semesters, I would say that reduces even further uh, to about 40 or 50 percent casework and uh, the other 50 or 60 percent being you know, uh, other types of pedagogy because you're at, in your elective semesters, things are getting much more specific, much more specialized to a segment, a sector, an industry, um, or sort of problem, type of problem, function that you are studying. So uh, the case has become a little less relevant from that from that standpoint. And I hope that that answers the question. Our, our students, and again, our outcomes tend to suggest that we're we're getting that we're getting that pretty pretty right. This is a great question and I I just I love that it's being asked um, because I do think that Emory does allow students to really personalize their MBA experience and that's again going back to that intimate learning environment is something that you can do really easily here. And I've heard Brian talk about his one-on-one -on -one independent studies that he's conducted for students who had a very particular need. Um, and there wasn't a course that directly um, spoke to that. So I'm going to let him talk more about it, but I'm, I'm just really glad that this question came up. I'm glad that it did as well. Um, I like the way that it's phrased too about personalizing the MBA program. I think that, um, you know, one of one of my kind of one of my objectives is to meet you where you are, right? To to uh, to to get to know our students as you know whole a whole person, and to meet you on your journey where you are, and and sometimes that does look like a very personalized relationship and experience for students. That largely depends on how much you lean into that and how much you put into that. But if you lean all the way into it, then this can be a highly personalized journey. And I speak from my own experience because it was highly personalized for me. I came into the MBA program with a great deal of healthcare experience and knew that I wanted to stay in that industry as I headed out of the MBA program. So I tried to get the most tailored experience that I could get to add real depth to my education. And I found my faculty to be very, very open, uh, open to that. And that gets me to the second half of your question about allowing full-time students to choose 
courses in other disciplines. So I mentioned that I'm a dual degree alum, so uh, MBA and Masters of Public Health, but I did not start off that way. And it's really important nuance there. I started out purely as an MBA student. And because of my interest in healthcare, I was advised and did take courses, some of my electives at the School of Public Health. That led me to wanna do more and go deeper and ultimately earn a second master's degree in it. But I didn't start out that way. And I think that's a really important um, thing to know for a question like you. We, like what you've asked here, we absolutely encourage you to take classes in other disciplines because sometimes just a class or two will give you the knowledge that you're seeking and give you the exposure that you're seeking. But sometimes it'll light a fire in you and you'll say, I want, I want to go further. And I think that's a real benefit. You know, we don't keep you locked into this scripted experience. And I certainly have benefited from that in my career. So I definitely try to make sure our students have a similarly personalized uh, experience. Oh, final thoughts. Brian, why don't you lead with your advice on folks, to folks who are considering an MBA and I'll follow. Yeah, so um, thank you, first of all, for investing this time with us and exploring um, Emory Gozueta Business School uh, in depth. I think that's a real testimony to your approach and uh, your seriousness about the process. I'll leave you with the visual of what we were trying to describe in our conversation. So if you think about the classic Venn diagram with the three circles that intersect, that first circle should be world-class academic institutions, right? And be thinking about us as in that set based on everything that we've shared with you today. Of course, there are other schools in that set, right? That are great schools, but when you overlap the fact that you get that academic experience in an intimately small, community, that learning environment, that set of schools starts to get really small. And then if you further overlap that, that third circle around doing that, having that experience in a great, dynamic, diverse city, then, you know, there we are at the nexus of those of those three circles. So, so think about that visual as you continue to, to think about schools. And if those three things, if meeting at that nexus, those three things are really important to you, you'll be a great fit for Gozueta. We'd be a great fit for you. Thanks, Brian. I'm going to put a little more of an admission spin on it and encourage everyone to continue this conversation. And clearly from the questions, there were some very specific personal questions that came up. Again, I saw we just posted the link to scheduling a consultation. My team's happy to talk to you. We enjoy our work very much. So please schedule a consultation. And while you go through this process, be really thoughtful about why you are doing it and what you hope to get out of it and stay true to those things for you. And as you go on this journey, a lot of people will have opinions about what would be best and how to choose a school. Um, and it's very important that you maintain integrity to yourself um, and awareness of what is best for you and let that be your guiding principle in choosing your school. So. I wanna echo Brian's thanks for you for being here today and for talking about Emory with us and Goizueta. And we look forward to continuing this conversation later on. Thank you so much.